Um, so Ryan, Ryan Pamplin is a VP at Meta. Um, he might argue that he's from the future or he's been seeing the future since he was a young lad of seven. Um, and um, let's see, his talk is called um, How the World Will See in 2020. And I'll just put it in his hands. Um, Thank you. And please, um, you're, you're open to questions as you go through? Bring them on. Great. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. So good to be here with you guys. Thank you for having me. Uh, I actually prefer this kind of intimate uh, conversation as opposed to me forcing a presentation down your throat. So if you have questions or comments or thoughts as we're going through this, it's a long workshop, so uh, please bring them on. I want your questions. Uh, it's going to make it a lot more interesting for all of us. So I'm Ryan Pamplin. I come from Silicon Valley. Uh, I am working on something that I'm really, really thrilled uh, to get to be working on right now. Um, the talk is called How the World Will See in 2020, which is a pun, if you didn't catch that. 2020, the year, and 2020, the vision. Ah, I like to set a low bar at the beginning. Uh, so, you know, I, I mean this seriously though, right? This is a technology that's going to dramatically transform the way that we see our digital worlds, uh, our digital information, uh, the way that we see our environments, and the way that we see each other. And it could go really right, and it can be awesome, or it can be terribly wrong and make the world uh, something like that hyper-reality video you might have seen. Uh, that would be very bad. I don't want that. And Meta doesn't want that. And we're fighting very hard um, to come up with the standards for how these things should work. Uh, and we're trying to be, you know, guided by neuroscience as opposed to just making up standards and doing AR for the sake of AR, um, trying to build something that is more natural. So I want to point out uh, one thing, which is the predictions uh, that I might be making here are mine. I'm not making any feature announcements for Meta, and the opinions that I'm expressing may not necessarily reflect the opinions of Meta. Uh, I haven't necessarily gotten legal clearance to say all the things I'm going to say. So uh, that makes it more fun, though, for me and for you. Um, this is really my childhood dream. Uh, that is me as a, as a kid, pre-glasses, right before I got glasses. And I was a nerd, might surprise you. Uh, but what happened is actually I got glasses and I was already using a computer a lot. Uh, by the time, gosh, when I was like three, I started using a computer every day because my parents had one and let me use it. Um, and when I was seven and I got glasses, I was like, wow. I want my glasses to have my computer inside of them. Uh, and for me, I just had this vision. I hadn't read science fiction yet or anything like that, but I had this vision that, you know, the computer could have all this information instead of on the screen at the time with like Windows, you know, 3. Uh, instead of that, putting it on top of the whole world. And I've been trying to make that a reality pretty much my whole life now. Uh, and I saw Meta uh, a couple years ago uh, when they put this on Kickstarter. And I got really excited about it. Uh, anybody here happen to be a Kickstarter of, uh, of the Meta One? No? Uh, I'll tell you that it was really exciting for me. I was doing startups and other stuff, uh, doing pretty well. Um, but this kind of disrupted my life. Because I saw this thing and I thought, oh my god. For the first time now, the technology and what I've been dreaming of are actually the same thing. And this thing is pretty terrible, Meta One, right? Um, relative to what we have now. I mean, it's like 40 degree field of view, very small. It's bulky. It's kind of like a bunch of parts glued together almost. Uh, it's a little better than that, but um, it wasn't that impressive for the general public, but it was impressive for anyone that believes that this is where we're headed. And what's important to understand is not that we're gonna have virtual reality on top of the real world. That's not actually necessarily a good thing. But what's important is the opportunity to shift a paradigm. So you guys, a lot of you are sitting in front of a laptop right now, which is a pretty big screen. It's a lot bigger than your phone, but it's still relatively small um, compared to your human field of view. And what we really wanna do is break out of the dimensions of these screens, right? And this is not a meta-specific thing. This is what AR is about, and this is what I think will make AR win. We're not limited anymore by these dimensions, but the worst part is the flatness 
of the screens, right? If we can put a digital layer on top of the real world that works far closer to how the real world works than how any computer has ever worked that has ever been built before, then I think that can provide a far more natural interaction, something where we can all be much closer to each other as opposed to getting sort of sucked into these screens and distracted from each other. And it's interesting because you hear a lot of people say digital layer on top of a world, but actually I think, and this is not a meta thing, this is a thing that I think, I think it's going to be multiple layers. I think you're going to see, you know, your layer for, uh, you know, your Uber, your layer for all the Yelp stuff, your layer for, you know, Pokemon Go, uh, whatever, whatever suits your fancy. Um, and it's going to take a couple years to get there, right? This is like at the beginning of, of sort of the adoption curve. And this is really the first time that the technology is good enough to put in the hands of the developers to create the applications and the experiences and the tools that are going to pave the way to a much broader audience of not just tens of thousands of devs, but actual end users. Um, this is a, a real video of a, an MRI scan uh, of a brain that I filmed with my iPhone through the glasses which was very profound for me. This was the first time that I looked at any real medical data in the glasses. And I showed this to, uh, this is Adam Ghazali's brain from uh, UCSF. And um, it was a very emotional experience for me to get to try because it felt very real and it, it made me sort of realize that, you know, I actually had a, had a friend, a really good friend of mine, co-founder of my last company, he had a brain tumor. And I did this where we looked at his brain um, and we, we went through with the doctors and surgeons um, explaining like the three different ways they could remove the tumor. And it was all 3D models but on flat screens. And it was really hard as, as someone who has no medical training to understand what they were talking about. And when I saw this I realized, wow, if medical professionals could see it this way, that would be very helpful. But also if patients could see it this way, it would just completely change the way that people understand the information. The information already exists, the 3D models already exist. It's just not being visualized as well as it could be. Um, so that's just one use case that got me a little bit excited. Uh, this is what Meta2 looks like. Uh, this doesn't happen a lot, but I actually brought one. So I'll just show you guys real quick what it looks like. And if anybody wants to see it after, you're more than welcome to come check it out. Um, so this is what it looks like right now. And this is what's gonna ship within a couple of months. And it's still, you know, kind of bulky, but it's not about the form factor today as much as it is about the form factor of tomorrow. And what's going to enable the form factor of tomorrow is creating really, truly useful applications and experiences that are going to pave the way from, you know, this sort of to, I think, uh, adoption within universities, adoption within hospitals, adoption within really every vertical, every industry uh, that you can imagine. I really don't believe that there will be any industry that's not affected by the technology. So I'll show you a quick uh, bit on the technology. So this is, uh, this is what it has today. So an optical engine of 90 degree field of view, um, which is really important. It's a lot bigger than Meta 1. And Meta is really good at listening to the feedback of people. I think no matter what AR company uh, is in the space, it's super important that they actually listen to the community of people developing for it and understand what needs to advance the fastest. Doing it all in a vacuum um, is, is pretty tough, I think, to uh, then come out with something that's going to make everyone happy. Um, so that big field of view is really important because what it means is when you're looking at things up close, the edges are not going to get cut off. And that allows you to really suspend disbelief. And the magic of AR is when you wear the glasses and you don't actually notice the glasses and you just become one with the content. I work in AR often, like just my daily work. Like I can take in an existing Windows application or soon Mac application and I can just put it in front of me. So I really wish I would have had the software on my Mac to, to use this on the plane because I was just sitting on the plane thinking, man, I wish I didn't have to use my laptop like this and I could just have the stuff right here. And I mean, that's something we're not too far away from. Um, direct hand manipulation is really important too. Being able to not do this and move things around, because that's not natural. This is natural. And making it work like that, I mean, you guys probably know a lot of you are probably studying topics that would enable that kind of thing. Um, that's hard. 
but we actually are figuring it out and uh, machine learning is, is our friend for sure. You know, just recording tens of thousands of people trying to pick things up and then throwing it into machine learning algorithms and figuring out actually how um, to do it with that is so much better than trying to do it with, with humans, right? You can never program an algorithm as good as the machine learning can come up with. So that's pretty exciting. And then another core technology is, is SLAM. So simultaneous localization and mapping, I'm sure some of you know what this is. Uh, this is hard as well, really hard. One of the biggest problems in AR, for anybody in AR. And essentially what we've done is combined two low noise cameras, which actually are here and here. And we also have a depth sensor here and an RGB sort of HD front facing camera. And then inside there's a six axis IMU that keeps track of sort of your rotation. Um, you combine all of that and you're able to understand the position of the headset relative to the world with no external tracking. So even today, even though it's tethered to a PC or a laptop or a pocket computer, you could actually make it mobile even right now with like a VR backpack, which I've done and it's really, really awesome. Um, it's not necessarily designed to map the whole world, but certainly it could and I think long term it will. Uh, I'll show you a quick video. Let's see if we have sound there. Let me switch um, the sound input one second. There we go. So I'll show you a quick uh, video that kind of shows you a little more. Um, two minutes uh, of what Meta is doing. I just tried the Meta development kit and I was completely blown. The best augmented reality heads up display that I've experienced. There was something, something special about this experience that you can't, you can't quite articulate. I mean, you just have to do it. It's definitely here and it's definitely real. I'm emotional because I've, I've never seen a product like this since the Macintosh. I was really, 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 really impressed. It blew me away. I didn't think that this, the, the graphical look was going to be that high resolution. And it really, it's amazing. You can almost like taste it. It's great. I'm, I'm blown away, you know. That was really amazing that I could just like grab something, pull it around. The Meta 2 comes closer than anything I've seen to what I imagined that our vendor reality would eventually be. To see that for the first time was, was really an extraordinary thing and truly a glimpse into the future of exploration, I think. What I just tried was so unbelievable so much further along than anything I could have expected that it upsets me that I can't literally leave the hotel and bring this technology with me. If, if you're interested in developing for AR, like this is the device. Jump on the bandwagon and start developing. All developers should definitely come to Meta. They are the future. They are the best. Now is where you establish yourself as a pioneer for where the industry is going to be going and uh, make a name for yourself. So go ahead. Get the Meta. It's awesome. I think the time has come for a much more natural machine, a machine that leverages the power of neuroscience to be an extension of our senses instead of going against them. We're no longer confined by the dimensions of the screens on our desks or the rectangles in our pockets. Instead, we can have the whole world as our desktop background. If you've been thinking about developing for augmented reality, now is the time to finally make your dreams come true. That guy's really cheesy. Uh, so. I don't want to market too much to you guys about meta, right? It's not just about meta. It's about augmented reality. It's about getting whatever device you can get your hands on right now and starting to really develop for this new world. There's going to be a lot of devices in the space. There's going to be a lot of amazing breakthroughs and amazing technology um, that is going to be in the hands of people within the next couple of years. Um, I'm just really excited that we can put it in the hands of people right now because honestly, what people create right now is what's going to define it. Like the hardware doesn't matter unless there's incredible software. And finally the algorithms are good enough for things like SLAM. The, um, you know, the tracking is good enough to touch and pick up and move objects around. These are really um, challenging problems, but uh, now it's about actually figuring out what it's useful for. When you think about true usefulness, there's things like BusyCalc, which I'm sure some of you have heard of, right? Apple II, first spreadsheet application, drove adoption of, of the Apple II. 
But why did it drive adoption of the Apple II? Not because it's a great spreadsheet application. It was the first one. But it's because of the alternative. The alternative was a paper binder called a ledger and a pencil and an eraser. And it was terrible. Orders of magnitude more difficult, more expensive for companies that needed to do accounting. And it was a huge breakthrough. And it was so much of a breakthrough, there was no way you could possibly go back to the old way of doing things. And that is the level of usefulness that we have to strive for. And it's not going to get created in a vacuum. It's going to get created by everyone in the world who knows what their problems are and knows what the solutions to those problems are. So uh, that's why it's so important to get it out there, even though it is early, right? I mean, you could wait for this thing to get down to you know, a glasses-like form factor, but I think then it would be too late to discover a lot of those groundbreaking, exciting ways to use and deploy the technology. So if any of you guys are thinking about getting an AR uh, or VR, it's definitely a big industry according to all the researchers. DigiCapital says 120 billion by 2020. AR is 75% of that 120 billion, which makes sense because it's not just about fun and games, it's about the way we work, the way we play, the way we shop, the way we learn, the way we collaborate, design, educate, communicate, really everything. And you gotta say thank you to Pikachu, right? Because with Pokemon Go, the awareness of AR is just at an astronomical level higher than it's ever been before. And it's kind of a terrible AR experience, it's not really AR, but it's uh, at least uh, spreading awareness and driving excitement. And I want to point out some of the differences between sort of AR and VR, right? AR is great for collaborating because of course you can see each other. So maybe you're an interior designer, you're working with an architect, and you can actually touch a building. This is old footage, so it's not even as good as it actually would look now but you get the idea of how you could collaborate uh, in real time, in person, and you can also do this remotely, which is um, pretty insane. So what I'm saying really is AR brings things into my world in a collaborative way, where you can see it, I can see it, we can all see it together, and VR sort of transports us into another world. They're both great. Here's the truth, though, and this is one of those things I'm gonna potentially get in trouble for saying. Convergence is gonna happen. So I believe very strongly that these devices are gonna be the same thing. It's gonna be a couple of years before that happens, but why not, right? A lot of the technologies are the same. It's just a matter of putting something you know, over my screen to block out the world, and now I have uh, VR. And of course, if I have really good tracking that doesn't need any external sensors, then uh, you have the whole VR experience in a mobile package. So a lot of the reason that I think we're excited about this is the design concessions that we're making right now. When you think about these devices, I mean, they're really well designed compared to what we had even you know, 20 years ago. Although I will say we're going backwards. How is there no headphone port? I was on the plane. I really didn't think this was a big deal. I didn't care about it. And then I was on the plane here and my iPad died. And I was like, okay, I'll just plug in my headphones and walk. Oh, whoops. So uh, just a funny uh, anecdote there. But, what we really want to do is kill the metaphors, right? We don't want to have to move a mouse around and then see it on the screen. We want to have direct human interaction where you innately know how to interact with things because you're a human and it works like the real world works. Uh, and it's hard to figure out how to do that. Um, but ultimately, if we nail that, right, this becomes a natural extension of you as opposed to a device that you have to conform to and learn how to use. Uh, so I'm going to show you guys what you see real live right now and kind of hopefully inspire you uh, with what's possible. So this is, uh, this is all real footage shot literally through the glasses. You can see sort of the nose piece over here. Uh, you saw some clips of this, but I've never shown this publicly. I'm not really allowed to show it publicly, but hey, here we are. Um, what's pretty cool is, of course, the ability to uh, just interact directly and then also have the blocks in this case interact with physical objects in the real world and the dexterity to be able to let's say sculpt something so even in this sort of developer stage I would say it's like sort of DK2 stage right now for AR um, it's good enough to have experiences that can blow away people who know nothing about AR uh, and of course you know 3D visualization is like a killer killer application, I think, right now for the technology. I mean, every big 3D modeling company is coming to us. Every big car manufacturer is coming to us uh, because they all want to see the stuff they're working on. They want to be able to modify in AutoCAD 
something on their computer and look over to the right and see the car sitting there life size. You know, I had a designer, a head designer at one of the biggest car companies tell me, it takes me seven years from design to driveway. And it takes me two years before I see the life size version of the car. And at that point, it's too late to make any terribly major changes. It's crazy. We can fix that stuff with, with AR right now. And it's funny, this application I use a lot, actually. So it's basically like Tilt Brush in the real world. Um, but what's cool is you can use multiple headsets and you can do it at the same time together. So for me, this has become a prototyping tool. I'm not a designer at Meta, but I like to come up with ideas and prototype them. The ability to just go into free space and start drawing an interface three-dimensionally, it kind of kills the whiteboard. And it enables a type of communication that uh, is much easier to understand when you're trying to communicate complex ideas. I think people are going to look back in like 10 or 20 years, and I think children that some of us will have in the future will probably be like, wait, wait, wait. You guys had these flat things, and everything was flat? And you tried to communicate everything in flat screens? Like, how did you do that? I think it's going to be like one of those things that's just shocking for people to hear and to understand that uh, we were limited in these ways. Here's a little secret. So this is going to be a strip of glass. It's going to be much closer to this within a couple years. We actually know how to build it right now. Can't build it right now. Certain things we've got to wait for. But uh, it's going to get commoditized, right? At the end of the day, everybody, just like these things, right? You, some of you probably have Androids, some of you have iPhones. They all look the same. It's the same form factor. What is going to transform is, uh, by 2020, I think, having this beautiful sort of glasses-like form factor much closer to this than to that. And I think design is going to differentiate, right? I don't think Versace and Armani and you know, Warby Parker and all these companies are just going to be like, nah, we're done. We're not going to make glasses anymore. I think they're going to want to get in on the action and start to put people's optical engines inside of their devices. And ultimately, I think what this is going to cause is mobile disruption. Some people in Meta uh, maybe don't agree completely on this point. Uh, I think more the timeline, and I don't know the timeline, to be honest with you, but I know for sure that my competitors uh, are not Magic Leap and HoloLens. Those are my friends, because they're convincing the world right now, along with me, that this is the next paradigm of computing. And actually, they're driving tons of adoption for us, right? Tens of thousands of developers who want to get this thing and start building for it. And what's cool is if you can build in Unity, the most popular graphics engine, 2 million plus uh, developers using it, then you can build for Meta. It's super easy. And you can easily take that ported over to HoloLens, I assume, but I don't know. Maybe you can ask some people in the audience. You'd be able to port it to Magic Leap as well. Uh, you know, the, the exciting thing is it's an open platform and you can start to build stuff that will work everywhere. But ultimately, I think the level of usefulness that's going to happen is going to compete with this. This is my competitor. This is what I have to beat. This is the bar. This thing, that thing, this thing, all of the screens in our world, that's what we need to become better than in order to replace and drive this paradigm shift. So the world is your desktop background. I'm going to make a prediction that I've never made before, but I talk about a lot. I've been thinking about this like literally my whole life, this particular thing. Um, I'm very interested in uh, how we can interact with our brains directly. And I've been reading lots of uh, research, and I've seen some demos of things recently, where they actually, right now, this is real, uh, it's actually, if you watch The Future of Storytelling, there's a video on this. They have a neural network that they're using to take an electrical signal from the human brain and in real time translate it into a very blurry image of what uh, the person is seeing. And what they do is they show them a set of pictures and then they can see essentially what they're seeing, not through their eyes, but through their brain's interpretation of what they're seeing through their eyes. And every neural network uh, has to conform differently to each person uh, in order to interpret their, their brain imagery. But the other way is possible too. So there's some experiments that have gone well recently where they've been able to inject imagery into uh, people's vision, into people's brains. Uh, and I, I believe very strongly that this is going to happen maybe by 2030, maybe later, maybe earlier. I don't know. I heard DARPA already has something that does this. I don't know if it's true. But I believe that glasses are not the ultimate form factor. And at that point, it's just got to be ubiquitous because a lot of people I know don't want to wear glasses, but if it's just a little device you can wear you know, behind your ear or something and then you get all of this 
on top of the world. You know, even if you want the iPhone experience, you can run the iPhone app and have it, right? So let's talk a little bit about future technologies. This is getting into the territory of, of stuff that um, we've never spoken about publicly before, and I don't think that many of the uh, AR companies would be willing to talk about this stuff. I'm willing to talk about it because I believe really strongly that we need everybody's help. We're 117 people. We're going to be over 200 people. But at the end of the day, it's not, um, it's not about just doing everything ourselves. It's about sharing knowledge and information and creating information uh, through studies that can inform you know, the neuro interface design principles. Like, What's the most natural way for us to interact with you know, picking something up? What's the most natural way to display uh, you know, a 3D model and what's the most natural way to touch it and rotate it and interact with it. We have a neuroscience team, we're coming up with these principles. We actually call it neuro interface design. It's a whole new area of interface design and we're giving away and evangelizing those principles to everyone, to the world. If everyone else that's doing AR copies, great, the world's going to be better for it because it's about a more natural way to interact. So here's one of the technologies that's going to change and rapidly push AR, 5G. So you guys probably heard about 5G. 4G LTE is what we have in the US right now. It's pretty good, but 5G is gonna be insane. So sub millisecond uh, latency with multi gigabit bandwidth. All that really means is you can do really intense graphical processing in the cloud on giant GPUs, as big or as small as you want, and you can deliver it to a device that's essentially a thin client that doesn't do all the compute on board. Uh, I'm not saying we're doing this. I'm just saying this is possible. And this is going to enable form factors of your dreams. And it's going to enable incredible graphical fidelity uh, much faster than you think. This is going to happen by 2020. Singapore is going to be the first country to have this. Um, they're deploying it nationwide. They're going to actually have it in certain cities next year, which is interesting for testing. There's also going to be photorealistic optics. So today it's 2.5K, 90 degrees. There's some other people out there like HoloLens where we know the specs. There's other companies where we don't know the specs. But at the end of the day, we're going to get to this point where the resolution uh, and the quality of the optic and the depth of the optic is incredible to the point that things will be maybe hard to distinguish You know what is a virtual object versus what is not. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. It's going to happen. Processing in the cloud is going to be inevitable. There's still a lot of computer vision problems, a lot of challenges around how we're going to uh, you know, map the world, how we're going to recognize objects, how we're going to make things you know, flawless. Right? There's still you know, a little jitter here and there and things that need to get corrected. It's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of really smart uh, PhDs and computer vision folks, uh, probably like some of you guys in the room, who are thinking about these kinds of problems. One thing that gets me really excited about this technology, and I don't know if anybody here has thought about this yet, but when I'm wearing this device, I'm creating a map of this whole room in real time. And it's a, it's a 3D model, essentially. Right now, it's local to the device. But imagine if instead of it being just on the device, it was uploaded to maybe the CMU cloud, right? And imagine if all the students were wearing a thinner, smaller, lighter version of this, using this for class, for taking notes, for capturing parts of lectures. Uh, that could all be uploaded and shared. And you could create a seamless map of the entire campus from 1,000 people that are walking around the campus using these devices. Let's expand that further. Now we have people walking around the whole world with these devices. You could literally create uh, an incredibly accurate model of the entire world uh, based on where everyone is going and, and using these things. There's all kinds of privacy implications and concerns, of course, about this. But this is an important factor because there's got to be persistence in the digital layer on top of the world. So if I take an object and I put it here and I leave and I come back, it should still be there. And it does that now, but it does that for my device. In the future, it's going to do it for everyone's devices. And these layers that I'm talking about, I think, will be shared between all of us. So there's probably public layers, there's private layers, maybe for you and your friends. These are all things that have to be figured out. Uh, and it's, it's going to take time. 
Uh, and it's going to take a lot of experimentation and a lot of really, really smart people to work on these things and figure them out. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about use cases that are emerging right now and use cases that I think are going to come in the near future as well. Um, I did say I want to make this interactive. So before I continue, does anybody want to ask anything about take the conversation in any other direction, uh, sort of on the things that we've been talking about? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, are there questions right now? Yeah, bring them on, bring them on. Let's do it. It's a super, super good question. Um, so uh, let's see. I have a couple different answers for you. So one, your brain, where the part of your brain is that understands touch, is not too far from the part that understands what you're seeing. And if you lock the tracking perfectly, you get a very strange sensation uh, where you, you almost feel like you're touching something even though you're not. So I can grab a, a holographic object and I can move it around and I get this sense of, of like, almost like it's real and it's not fake because it's locked so well. If the tracking isn't very good, uh, then it doesn't work. Um, about 5% of people that we have given demos to out of thousands have said that they feel a tingling sensation, which is just a neurological thing that's happening. There's nothing physical that's going on. Um, there is technology being developed right now that um, we're not developing necessarily. But in Japan, there's uh, researchers, and now there's a bunch of startups in Europe and in Silicon Valley who are creating uh, haptics with ultrasonics. So it's essentially like the sensor in your bumper of your car, like the backup sensor. Um, so it's, it's emitting a sound that you can't hear, an ultrasonic uh, wave, essentially. And they're able to do this at about 10,000 frames per second. And um, when you touch something, you're not actually feeling it like this. You feel when you move. It's the friction of your, your hand or your body to the surface. So what they're able to do is actually emulate all different surfaces. Um, so you could, in theory, not saying we're doing this, put it in the headset and you could feel, uh, but only from this way, right? Or you could build a tabletop that has these emitters in it and you could you know, feel here. Uh, there is a way that they figured out to do it through the skin as well and come out the other side, but I don't think it's safe. So I don't think it'll be productized. <laughs> but I actually felt it. I tried it. It's awesome. Uh, it's cool by itself, but when you wear the glasses and you can see an earth, and it has a, a model of the texture of the earth, and you can feel it as you're moving around, it's very clearly the future. It's got to be. I think haptics are inevitable for AR. How dedicated are you guys to um, maintaining connections with the open source community for content creation? Extremely. Yeah. I'm all about open source, um, personally. I love it. Um, we're building a new operating system built from the ground up, um, which will, it's not really announced completely, but uh, it's going to be spatial. So we don't want to put Windows on your face or Android on your face. We don't want flat panels. We want something that is volumetric. Um, and it will uh, very likely, again, I'm not announcing, but just saying likely that we'll have a Linux kernel of some kind. Um, at, we're going to open source a ton of our applications that we're shipping with. So your effort is that you're actually going to try to do something to not on the call that's that, not necessarily something which has to be tethered to the laptop. So today we're tethered, but uh, we're working towards you know having something that's totally mobile. Uh, I think that's got to be where we go. Um, but the truth is, something like Hololens is is really limited by the power of Hololens, right? I mean. It's a cool device. They've nailed it with the tracking and within the package of what they built, it's awesome. But there's a lot of limitations, particularly field of view and then processing power, right? 300,000 polygon models pushing it to the, to the top end of what's possible with HoloLens. You can run like seven and a half million polygons in a meta and for a lot of use cases, you know, that's a really big deal. I think for education, that's a really big deal. Um, you know, actually, I was, in, uh, I was in China recently and I met with, um, Minister of Education. And he said to me, we have more students in our country than you have people in your country. And we believe that all of our students will be taught with augmented reality within the next couple of years. So there's a very big push there to, um, to make that happen. And they tried HoloLens. I mean, it's too expensive for their market. Microsoft isn't prioritizing China. 
um, and you know the field of view is, is not going to help educate people, right? If I want to look at a human body and see it life size and be able to walk around it or you know perform uh, sort of surgery on it uh, for practice, this isn't going to do the trick. It's got to be it's got to be bigger. So it's really you know open source stuff and let people build cool stuff and then understand what are the limitations people are running into, iterate on the hardware and quickly, you know, every 12 to 18 months, come out with a new version of the technology that addresses uh, those concerns. You know, cutting edge, uh, you know, every, every opportunity that we have to, uh, you know, take that feedback and productize it into something. So rapid iteration cycles relative to, you know, the pace that the technology has been at so far. I have one more question. Yeah, please, sorry. please. No, me. don't be sorry. Um, have you guys been thinking at all about, about gaze trapping? About um, yeah. knowing, I'm, I'm assuming that that's not going to be in this version, but. but it's, okay. it's not in this version, but uh, without saying that we're doing it, I can tell you that in future AR devices, I think uh, eye tracking is absolutely essential. <coughs> so today, the way you get around eye tracking is when you put it on, you follow a little light uh, drawing with your eyes and it figures out where your eyes are relative to uh, the device. So in order to, to register objects with the world properly, you need to understand eye position here and you also need to understand distance between the eyes. Yeah. So it's a very quick calibration, but it's essential because otherwise it won't actually feel like things are properly registered. And when you look around, they'll, they'll swim and that just wrecks the magic of it. Steve Mann is your chief scientist. And yes. He's a strong advocate for privacy yes. and ownership over one's own data. Yeah. We sort of spoke to the idea that we might be recording in three dimensions yeah. of the world around us. What, who do you see owning that data? Does Meta, does that sort of, in, within the open source conversation? I don't think that Meta has a desire to own your data in that way. Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer to your question yet. Does Steve know the answer? Steve might, I spend a lot of time with Steve. Steve's, I don't know if you guys know who Steve Mann is. He's like one of the fathers of wearables and augmented reality. Um, he's uh, good crazy. Um, I love talking to him. He, he goes off on these crazy tangents and uh, he will literally spend like eight hours talking to you if you allow him to, which I have. Um, the man is a genius. Um, he has very interesting perspectives on uh, valence which is sort of the uh, term that he is, I believe, coined. And he's actually invented devices that are AR devices that allow you to see surveillance. So for example, if there's a camera, let's say mounted up in the corner, a security camera, he's actually come up with a way to be able to see that stream of what the camera is capturing in the real world with, uh, right now, an LED wand that he waves around and it shows you. Uh, but he wants to do it in, in AR. So privacy is very important to us. Um, one thing that's also important is for everyone not to look like weirdos, right? If I'm up here like doing this, I'm going to look kind of weird if you don't see what I'm interacting with. So there is the setting of public by default, which means that whatever I'm doing, you're going to see maybe not exactly what I'm doing, right? If I'm looking at my banking information, you're going to see that I'm on a, a web browser, but you're not going to see my banking information. So uh, figuring out a balance of privacy, but also not... Um, doing things that would hurt the brain because it doesn't make sense, uh, it's really important. And these privacy issues are issues that we, I think as an industry, have to figure out because they're not exclusive to Meta. And I think you know, the best scenario is not to have uh, a world where you know, only certain things work on Meta and only certain things work on other platforms and you, know, you get locked out of particular types of, of content or particular layers of the world if you choose one platform over another. So I hope that there's a certain level of openness and uh, intercompatibility. Uh, we're certainly going to try to make that happen. Or we'll come back to you. Uh, yes. Okay. Austin from School of Design, faculty member. Hey. Um, so you mentioned about direct hand manipulation and the benefits of it. But the way how I see it is, if you're going to have digital elements floating in space, just like a computer uh, environment where um, digital elements have limit, you know, limitless possibilities. Um, can you apply something similar? Because I see benefits in being able to manipulate contents that I cannot reach in mm -hmm. real space. If there's a physical digital element floating in that location, I'd rather 
become a Jedi, Jedi and just manipulate conditions, for example. Yeah. So what what is natural? What is natural in that mixed reality or augmented reality world from, from your point of view? Yeah. Um, I think these are the types of interactions that we have to study. And the way that we would approach this, I don't know the answer yet, but I guarantee you we're going to come up with an answer to this, and we're going to give it away for free. Uh, so you know, you asked about open source. Open source uh, for us means open sourcing our, our neuro interface design principles. That's like the first major uh, piece of research that we're spending enormous resources on, and then giving away to the world. Um, so what we'll do is have this question posed to our neuroscience team. They'll then design a, a test inside of Meta where we'll bring in thousands of people and we'll give them demonstrations and we'll have them try five different ways to do what you're asking. And then we'll record all the sensor data and we'll record the error rates and we'll record how accurate and how pleasant of an experience it is and how much time it takes them. And we'll figure out what seems to be the most natural way to do these kinds of things. And then we'll build it into our SDK and our documentation and advocate to the world that things get done that way. That's what neuro interface design principles are all about. And it's about not just being arbitrary, ooh, this is probably the best way to do this, but to actually do it the way that the scientific studies tell us that we need to do it. hands, I like your pun. Um, so I, I think that technologically there's no limitation. We don't require to pick up this. I don't have to do a very specific gesture. I can just do this and it will work. Or I can just do this and hold it and it will work. Um, which is really cool. Uh, it poses some challenges for designers though because how do you tell it, okay, this, you know, when they grab it, I want it to move. So, those are things we're coming up with and, and building in. Uh, so you can say, you know, certain standard things like the equivalent of the pinch to zoom or the grab, that all exists. Partial grab, full grab, um, all those kinds of things are built into the SDK. But then you can also define your own sort of interactions. So if someone does this, you react in a certain way. Um, you can also just not do any gestures. It's actually designed to be gestureless. So it's really just about collision. So if I pick something up, it's about the collision of that and having it interact and react naturally. So we try to simulate gravity and make it work the way that the real world works. If you wanted to modify that, you certainly could. Yes. But obviously in between there's going to be many, many devices and all these demo videos I always see like a serene room and then just that. But then we imagine you're in like the middle of Times Square and yep. you're using augmented reality. Like how uh, practical it is. So like my, my, question, uh, my question is uh, like do you have to, if you're, are you developing for convergence or are you like, or do you have to sort of develop for the in between like one? Uh, while we still do have like all these screens and yeah. the relics of the past, like they are still here. I think yeah. there's there's a way to extend the existing devices on the path to displacing them. So could you replace a monitor with this today? Yes. Are there use cases where that makes sense, like in an operating room? Absolutely. Um, I think the test that you have to, to put yourself through right now is okay. The device is a little bit cumbersome right now because it's large. You're not going to wear it outside unless you're, you know, crazy uh, or cool uh, or both. But the idea of, you know, an application or a tool that's so useful is going to make this something that people will adopt, right? So consumer today, it's not going to happen. But surgeon, sure. Car designer, sure. Uh, student working on computer vision, obviously. 
3 d designer absolutely I mean there's a lot of specific ways that this can be used today, and we have to design with the limitations in mind of the technology today so there's still some opacity right it's not a hundred percent you know like there's no true black in AR. Maybe there is you know, going to be soon, but there's not right now. Um, so you can have dark, 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 dark gray, but black is actually transparent in AR. And everything is slightly translucent in AR right now. So we're gonna get to a point um, where it is opaque, um, but it's gonna take some time for the technology to advance to make that happen. And in the meantime, design around the limitations. So you mentioned this sort of hyper-realism idea of that we're going in this direction where things will actually look real when they're in our headsets and everything. And also, when the haptics are there, it'll feel really real picking them up. Do we actually want that? Like, I can imagine some situations where, like, maybe you're a surgeon and you accidentally grab your virtual scalpel instead of your real scalpel. And you can't <laughs> <laughs> like, what happens when things get too real and you can't distinguish the digital? That, that's a, a great philosophical question. Um, and I don't know the answer. Um, it's very interesting to think about. I think it's one of those things we're going to have to get there in order to figure it out. And it's, it's probably going to be, I don't know that the optics will produce something indistinguishable until the point that there's a direct, you know, interface to maybe our brains. Um, I think you'll still notice certain subtle differences, but I think our brains will become accustomed to this as being the norm. You know, and just like, you know, the kids that have grown up on these things are better at using them than all of us. Um, you know, it's, it's maybe going to be the same sort of, sort of thing where we have to um, just sort of uh, suspend disbelief and treat these virtual objects as first class citizens. I don't think it's going to be a problem. We're going to have to confuse them quite yet. Talk to me in 10 years. Finger gym. Finger gym. <laughs> you got to go to the finger gym to work out your hands. And <laughs> um, it's a really bad joke. Uh, so we, I don't care if you guys laugh at me or with me, either way. Um, it's a great question. I think it's just building up stamina from using it, right? Practice. Um, you know, I think if you would have taken someone who'd never sat at a desk all day and used a keyboard all day and used a mouse all day, they'd be fatigued too. So it's just a matter of getting used to it. I'm pretty used to it now. Like, I don't get fatigue. I can use it for hours and hours and hours. I don't even think about it. Um, I think in any activity that you do for a sustained period, you can become fatigued. But with practice, you will overcome it. You were talking about scanning the world earlier. Yeah. Good questions. I don't know all the numbers off the top of my head, but I'll tell you what I do know. So there's two um, monos, two black and white uh, industrial grade cameras that have a combined 270 degree field of view. Uh, so they can almost see behind your head. Um, and they're running at 60 frames per second. Uh, and they are um, very low noise. They're good in low light. And that is combined with the six axis IMU, which is incredibly low latency. We run a filter on the optics because it takes a moment for the processing of that, uh, tens of milliseconds. And uh, we filter it with the uh, IMU data. So if you're moving this way, it's going to be IMU. If you're moving dramatically, it's going to be optics or some combination. And then there's prediction algorithms that are happening. So if I start to move this way, humans don't move like that, right? We move in a smooth motion. So we're able to predict essentially where you're going to land and we start to show you frames um, ahead of where your head is going. So it really seems locked to the world and this has actually been probably the hardest computer vision problem that as a company we've had to solve. Um, Dr. Serato, uh, who started doing SLAM in the 90s, um, is the one who came in recently and really helped us take it to the level that it's at now. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it'll run with the MacBook. So we don't have an OS released today, but we're working on an operating environment which will become an OS. Um, there will be a preview version of the OS um, in terms of an operating environment uh, that you'll get in December, January, whenever you get your unit. Uh, we will start shipping in December in limited quantities, and then we'll ship uh, in volume in January, February. 
Um, and if, uh, if you're going to do something really cool, if anybody here is going to do something really cool, you have a friend at Meta. So you can come talk to me after and I might have a VIP list where I can maybe help you get earlier access. Um, but uh, yeah, the MacBook compatibility is really important to me because as you see, I use a MacBook Pro. Um, so you probably know Apple's coming out with a new MacBook Pro with a much better GPU in it um, by the end of the year. So I would recommend getting that. Uh, today you'll have to run Windows on it in order to use the SDK, but we're committed to supporting uh, OS X as, uh, as a platform um, for... Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, with Meta 2. We will support Mac OS as soon as possible, mainly because I only use Mac OS and I hate booting into Windows. Uh, most of our entire company, like, that's not working on the programming of the product is, is actually on OS X. Um, I mean, ultimately, we want to displace all of these OSs, uh, but on the way to displacing them, we've got to be compatible with them. It's also not impossible for someone to, let's say, make it work with any other platform, right? Somebody could potentially take some of our open source components and port it to Android, and you could actually maybe power it from your phone. It's not out of the question in terms of possibility. And if somebody wanted to do that, we would certainly help them do that. So correct me if I'm wrong. It seems that uh, the structure, the hardware, it looks as if it's using Equiscope's effect. Mm. How is it different from HoloLens or Magic Leap? Uh, technology and and is that an advantage in, in the price point? Yeah. Uh, so that's my first question. Um, so I'm asking about affordability. Sure. And the second one is, um, I heard that apparently Windows Holographic would be available on various devices. Mm. Uh, the, as a VP, do you, what what do you think about that possibility? Yeah, great question. So one, cost is essential. Cost is is the biggest uh, barrier to having a true ecosystem. 3,000, 3,500 for a device is too much money. People will pay for it, but it's the wrong people, right? Selling this to a bunch of enterprises is gonna get you stuck in the vertical graveyard. That's not where we wanna be. We want it in the hands of the same people who made VR into what it is today. Um, the people with vision who are experimenting and trying new things and, you know, we have to define how this stuff works. You know, this is a new medium. Like, you know, I was talking to someone really smart recently about, you know, what is a cut? In, uh, in, in AR, you know, because for film, it took a long time to figure out a cut. So we're gonna have a lot of those same kinds of challenges in AR, and I don't believe that those are gonna be solved at big giant companies. I believe they're gonna be solved by people like you. Uh, and I care way more about getting into your hands. Could we sell it for a lot more money? Yeah, we, we probably could. Studies have shown and su suggested that people will pay higher prices for this kind of technology. Um, we're actually not really making money on this, right? We're, we're just trying to uh, get as many units out the door as possible because we think the ecosystem is the value. Um, and you know, I'd rather lose money in every unit and have it in the hands of um, people that are gonna create the new version of the cut uh, than I would uh, have a bunch more money in the bank because we charge more money for the units. In terms of Windows Holographic, um, Windows Holographic goes against everything we believe in. Um, it's, it's not a natural interface. It's not trying to be the most natural machine. Um, it's very much about flat things uh, you know, on your face. It violates a lot of our neuro interface design principles. So will it evolve into something that aligns with those principles? It probably will, because I think the market is gonna show that there's a desire for that, and I think they will adapt, because that's what they do. They're a big company, they're smart, they have a lot of resources. Um, could someone make Windows Holographic run on this? Sure, you could. Um, you know, we, we, they've come to us, right? I mean, they would like to see Windows Holographic on our device. Um, we would, uh, I think, prefer not to have it on there. Um, but if there's certain use cases and people want to hack in and do it, it's an open platform. So be my guest. If you do it, let me know. I'd like to try it out. <laughs> Quite heads up. It's 3:30, yep. and cool. the next session starts at 3:45. Okay, cool. Uh, you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk that uh, uh, Kei Jimitsu does a uh, hyper reality videos. Yes. And um, how you don't want that. Yes. And I was kind of wondering if you could expand on that, and also kind of like in, in, uh, maybe within regards to questions of like possibilities of um, um, uh, pervasive advertising and questions of censorship. I guess. <laughs> like, um, what like, uh, maybe like uh, allowing certain types of layering and. In maybe disallowing certain types of layering, yeah. uh, the, the implications of that. 
Yeah, that's a really cool question. Um, so I like the hyper reality video. It's cool to watch. Yeah, too, for great. Um, but boy, oh boy, I don't want that. Yeah. You know, um, I think that's what's going to happen if we do it wrong. Um, you know, if, if only game developers uh, build AR, then maybe that's what it will look like. Um, so, in terms of, of advertising, uh, I come from advertising actually. So um, I made a lot of TV ads, and then I created software for measuring ads. Um, and I, I enjoyed that a lot, but I find that I wasn't adding a lot of value to the world. Um, I was kind of uh, taking from the world and not, not enhancing and making humanity better. And um, I'm doing this because I, I want to make humanity better, because I believe we can build a more natural machine. And I really hate when I'm in a meeting and this happens, and people are like, uh-huh, keep talking, keep talking. I hate that. So we have to try to figure out a balance of how much information we can put and how, how does a notification work? You know, how, how does you know, an object work that's in front of you, how does it not become distracting when we're having a human interaction? How do we, instead of in me getting distracted by it, turn it into something where we're sharing in this experience together? Um, we, we actually just want a meta layer on top of the real world, as opposed to taking you into a fictitious world. You know, we don't want to turn your world into Harry Potter. We want to, um, you know, be able to, to look at a flower and, you know, maybe touch the flower and have it tell you all about that flower and, you know, give you more information. So it's really about kind of enhancing the human experience as opposed to completely altering and destroying it. Um, I hope that's, yeah. Any, uh, anybody else uh, have any more of those before I jump through a couple use cases? All right, so let's talk about a couple of my favorite use cases. Um, volumetric video is going to be amazing. Imagine right in front of you seeing your favorite play or your favorite musician, and they're standing in front of you life-size, and you can walk around them, and you can see them from any angle, and it really gives you the sense of presence that has never been possible any other way. That's real right now. I get to play with that stuff. It's awesome. And the people who are coming to us that want to create with this are incredible, incredible people. So you're going to see some really amazing showcases of this technology uh, very soon. Not just people that buy units, but you're going to see companies and venues and artists and makers and scientists and universities and all sorts of people have these things deployed and you're going to be able to probably, in the not-too-distant future, go see you know, a concert from your favorite artist or at least a couple artists where you can you know, put on the thing and it enhances the concert and it brings the experience to you in a way that you know, has never really been possible before by adding all this extra stuff on top. We're not about fun and games, but we are very much about defining this new medium. And fun and games are going to be part of that and entertainment is going to be part of that and art is very important to us. Uh, and I'm really excited for... Um, artists to pick up the new canvas and start to mold it and shape it into whatever they want it to be. Uh, obviously for sports it's going to be huge too. I, I've been talking to a bunch of big sports teams and there's something really cool that we're working on where this whole table becomes the court or the field of the sport and you can sit in your luxury box with the glasses and sit around. You can have your drink on the table and you can see the sport happening real time because it's being volumetrically captured in real time and played back. Um, that's going to happen, you know, very soon. Not, not 2020, but faster than that. For government, it's huge. The Chinese government is all over this. They are driving adoption so fast, so hard. They're investing so much money, and so many Chinese companies are pouring money into this industry with us, with Magic Leap, with others, with the content creators. It's almost like unlimited funding from, from their um, which is uh, really exciting. Um, but what I think it points to is an adoption curve that's going to be dramatically faster uh, there than it is here. They actually have an aptitude test where they ask students uh, questions. And the question that they asked recently was, what will the impact of augmented reality and virtual reality be on the world? So literally, like, millions and millions of students in China uh, have been asked this and are aware of this. And you know, there's one entity that I know of that's actually uh, building a dev studio with 500 developers just to build AR applications uh, right now for the government and various uh, 
parts of the government over there. Of course, gaming is going to be huge. I can wear the glasses, you can wear the glasses, we can play laser tag with each other or whatever else you want to, you know, you want to come up with. You could do it in person where we're adding a layer or maybe even remote. Maybe you're in another place and I'm seeing you run around here and, you know, you're actually running around the other side of the world, but you're seeing me run around your environment. Education is one of those areas that I'm very passionate about, very excited about because we've done studies, the neuroscience studies that I was telling you about. This one was... Um, we gave instructions on how to build something, and then we gave instructions uh, in video, and then we gave instructions in AR, and the percentage improvement in retention of information and the ability to uh, grasp complex concepts is a huge, huge number, like double digit, in some cases, even 100 plus percent improvements. Uh, so I think if you're gonna learn something like anatomy, uh, or if you want to look at all the greatest works of art and see them life-size right in front of you, uh, that's all very possible. Uh, it's part of our old demo. It's a human body, of course. Now we have a fully functional human body with every layer inside of it. Uh, you're going to see some of those things deployed at a couple of the top schools uh, in the U.S. pretty soon. So for medical imaging, for you know having a human body that's life-size on this table and a virtual scalpel and be able to actually do a virtual surgery, that's something people are working on right now and looking to deploy into educational institutions within the next 12 to 18 months, which is pretty exciting. For training, there's every space agency, SpaceX, private, public, China, Russia, US, everybody's buying these to create uh, training for astronauts, which is pretty cool. Uh, I don't know the details because I haven't seen what they're building yet in most cases, but um, it's cool that those people are adopting the technology Professional sports leagues and teams are also adopting the technology, which is pretty cool. For complex assembly, it's a no-brainer, right? If I'm assembling a car and it can just tell me, this piece goes here, this piece goes here, this piece goes here, or even an IKEA couch, right? I could not only place the virtual couch from the virtual catalog in my home and see if it fits, but then I can order it, and then it can arrive, and then it can tell me how to put it together. That's definitely how it's gonna work uh, in the future, because you can assemble much faster, much more accurately, for retail, you're gonna be able to walk in. This is gonna happen soon. I know of a couple customers of ours who are gonna do this in the next 12 months, less than that even. You're gonna be able to walk into a showroom for their product, products that aren't out yet, and you're gonna be able to see it live as if it's really there, even maybe if it's a car, let's say, sit inside of it, maybe even honk the horn in the virtual car. But you're not gonna be cut off in VR. You're gonna be able to see it from uh, you know, your perspective as well as the person you're with, and it's gonna sort of seem more real than it is not real. Uh, 3D design, of course, e-commerce is going to be huge. I've been talking to all the big e-commerce companies. In China, they're already digitizing the catalogs of the products for VR and now porting over to AR as well. Today, monitor replacement is already something that's possible. Uh, you guys kind of saw that footage earlier. For the sake of time, I'm going to just continue. This one is really, really profound to me. Uh, this one is like emotional to me because I travel a lot. Um, I've been all over the world for Meta and I'm not home a lot and I miss people in my life that are important to me and a phone call doesn't do the trick. FaceTime is better but it's not quite what I'm looking for. The ability to see me and for me to see you real time as a hologram be able to walk around and see each other life size and even draw together or collaborate or watch a TV show together. The sense of presence is, is something that is very special and I know that alone could just drive adoption of this. Uh, what I'm really saying to you guys throughout this whole talk is the possibilities of what this can do are endless. The biggest challenge that we all have, anyone who wants to work in AR, is knowing what to focus on. Because there is nothing that won't change because of this in terms of computers and all these things. It's going to take a lot of time, but it's going to be um, very impactful in certain places. And understanding and, and guessing right and validating what those are is the most important step between the paradigm we're in now and the paradigm that we're headed towards. Uh, long term, you can kiss your phone and your laptop and your TV uh, goodbye. Uh, and if you're interested in, in joining us, seeing what kind of opportunities we have, we actually are hiring a lot. Uh, so if you do have any interest in uh, seeing what we have, internships, any of that kind of stuff, computer vision, uh, this is our website, metavision.com. You can go there and click join meta or go to slash join dash meta. And I also want to open myself up to you guys to be a resource. Uh, you can write down my email. 
I'm more than happy to help you in any way I can. Um, you know, that's what this is all about, is, is being a resource and helping empower people to make their dreams come true. Uh, and we can't do it without folks like you guys. So uh, thank you so, so much. Such a privilege to be here.